Paul Mensa's Wall of Power TV is brought to you in part by Iron Range Resources and Rehabilitation, Two Gingers Irish Whiskey, Gray Wolf Lodge, your home away from home in the North Woods, and the Solar Arts Building in Northeast Minneapolis. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Wall of Power TV. I'm your host, Paul Metza. I couldn't be more excited to have my special guest on tonight. Cornbread Harris was born in Chicago, Illinois, on April 23, 1927. He is a great piano player and singer who has been a fixture on the Twin Cities music scene for over 70 years. I got to meet him when we both played weekly gigs at Nikki's Bar downtown Minneapolis in the early 1990s. We've been friends ever since. He was a band member of the legendary early rocker Augie Garcia in the mid-1950s for several years and will regale us about the time they opened up for Elvis Presley, among other things. He was a winner of the 2013 Sally Award for Commitment and in 2012 was inducted into the Minnesota Blues Hall of Fame. We've got a lot to talk about, so let's get right into it. My good friend Cornbread Harris. Cornbread, good to see you, my friend. Good to be seen. <laughs> how, uh, how are you doing today? Oh, today I'm doing quite well. Good. Yeah. Well, I know uh, you're still playing weekly gigs. I mean, you have been ever since I've known you since the early 90s. That is true. I used to play once a week. And then I started playing twice a week. Then I started playing three times a week. Wow. And then I start adding little small gigs in between the three times a week. So I think when I was, uh, before I played the one time a week, I was retired. <laughs> but you're having a nice comeback now. This record recorded uh, at the Hook and Ladder oh, Lounge. Hook and Ladder. And that's Fabulous such a gorgeous place. picture of you, too. Fabulous as well. place. Man, that dude over there is, is just somebody. That Chris Mazzina, he, you he heard him? and uh, Jackson Buck and the boys, they do a great job over there. That's his name. You know. Yeah. They've got, Chris. well, t tell us about, you know, you are 90 years old. You are the oldest person we've had on Wall of Power TV, next to me. Okay, next <laughs> to you. Okay. Okay, old man. Go ahead. So uh, when did you start playing piano? Oh, 17 or 18 years old. Okay. But I was, that was because of uh, music lessons, how I started playing piano. Uh, I went to uh, St. Bernard School. Okay. And they had, it was a Catholic school, and they had the nuns there, and they taught music lessons to the kids. So I had to go to music lessons. I didn't want to go. Uh, three years old, my parents died. Uh, so I was in many foster homes, oh, Chicago foster homes, Detroit, Kansas City, uh, St. Paul and Minneapolis, of course, <laughs> Wow. Uh, foster homes. And my, finally, my grandparents took me in, and uh, so I stayed there till they died on the highway after selling their automobile. Peerless Arrow, one of the finest cars that ever hit the road, and they bought a nice Rambler, almost even trade, and they took a vacation and they got killed on the highway. Oh. But they had left their home to my sister and I. I never mentioned my sister before. And uh, so I, we sold the home, and she went to Denver, Colorado, and I stayed in St. Paul until I finished high school. Then I went into the service. The music, uh, my memories of my first music was about that time when I really started thinking about music. And of course, that was Hank Williams and that kind of thing. Hmm. Country music. Were you listening to the Grand Old Opry? Grand Old Opry, oh man, fabulous show. You know, it's amazing. I used to book a, a blues club in town for about seven or eight years. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing how many of the older blues cats that came from Chicago uh, and Detroit and uh, Mississippi, mm -hmm. how many of them uh, 
grew up listening to the Grand Ole Opry and yeah. loved country music. Sure. And so we had country music and spiritual music because my church affiliations were Baptist, Episcopalian, okay. that kind of thing. Holy Roller, that was my biggest one. They believed in singing some songs mm -hmm. and having a good time. And so all of these things were indelibly imprinted on my mind and psyche. So when I had my country and my spirituals, I had that listening experience. And then when I got older, where I could go to the bars and stuff, I went to uh, the Negro section, the black section, uh, whatever, of town in St. Paul and heard the jukebox playing the blues and the rock and roll and uh, doo-wop. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, wow, here's another style of music. And so I, I kind of gravitated toward a blues thing mm -hmm. and found out that spirituals just fit right into there. And country, all I had to do was put in sevenths and minors, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden my country music was blues music. <laughs> and so uh, I started playing that without having the experience of being around blues music very much. And then they told me, oh, you play so authentic. Well, I play authentically what I got impressed with mm -hmm. and mixed it all up into this one style, made my own style because I didn't stay around the music very long. The cornbread gumbo. Gumbo, yeah, thank you. Yeah, jambalaya crawfish pond. Yeah. You know, and so. Neo Mayo. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Let's see. laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I when did, did you start? When did you start playing with Augie Garcia? Okay, I started playing with Augie Garcia. For those of you that don't know, Augie Garcia was probably one of the first rock and rollers in the Twin Cities. And Saint we, Paul kid, right? Yeah, uh, Saint Paul West Side they called it, mm -hmm. just across the river from the airport down there in the hole at the end of the bridge, and then you turned to the left and went down in the hole down there. And I lived down there a while, too, before I ever met Augie. But I happened to meet him because I played at, um, not played, worked at American Hoist and Derrick at the end of the bridge. Across the street from American Hoist and Derrick was a bar that Augie and his drummer man you, did you know the drummer man's name? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I might think of it. So, it wasn't Ringo, was it? Ringo? <laughs> <laughs> Ringo Starr, sure, that was him. No, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> so you're playing with Augie Garcia. Do you remember okay. what year you started with Augie? Uh, no, but I got uh, some papers that you can check on. It was probably the early 53, 54, <laughs> something like that. Yeah, in 55 and 56, too. Right, <laughs> right. And uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a mixed band, wasn't it? You oh, had, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, mostly uh, Mexican and Negro and white. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's mixed. Is it? <laughs> okay. And but so, for its time, that was a little ahead of its time. I mean, there wasn't a lot of integrated bands. Oh, no. I had clubs just, back then. I had just come from being uh, terribly treated on uh, Northeast Minneapolis. Oh, uh, you know, was it was just terrible. I thought hmm. the prejudice that was there, and everything, and as as an entity, uh, and I've always loved this. Uh, when they take one person out of the race, that even though they're prejudiced, they can't help liking that person, and 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 so they they use that person as a oh no, I'm not against so and so. So and so is my best friend. Right. You know, I said, well, <laughs> one best friend doesn't make a thing that the whole uh, universe is going to put you up as uh, a righteous human being. Uh, yeah, a righteous human being. It's not one person not going to do that for you. 
What were the crowds like? I mean, you're, you're playing uh, oh, to a lot boy. of teenagers. Was that a mixed crowd, too? Oh, that was a mixed crowd, too. And that was another thing. I wondered how long that was going to last <laughs> at the time. Uh, the crowd was huge, and it was like three and four nights a week. Wow. I did, oh, in fact, I think I earned my most money playing music when I was playing with Augie. Well, and that was back at, uh, you had a house gig at the River Road Club. Yeah, the River Road Club, Minnesota, Mendota, Minnesota. Hmm. Welcome back to All of Power TV. I'm your host, Paul Metza. Our guest tonight, Mr. Cornbread Harris. When Augie and, and you guys opened up for Elvis Presley, that must have been, what, 1956? Oh. Yes, yes. The, the mighty Colonel... Colonel Tom Parker. Oh, yes, okay. We were opening up at St. Paul in Minneapolis at these uh, you know, big time music venue centers. The auditoriums. Auditoriums and stuff. And so we were, I don't know how we got the job to open for the man. Well, you guys were the most popular band in town. Oh, is that what it was? Yeah, I'm sure. Oh. That's what I've read. What? Well, well, you see picture of uh, uh, you guys playing with in Augie's band. There was hundreds, if not thousands, of teenagers at some of those dances. Oh, true, now that you mentioned it. Yeah. Okay, but uh, I don't know. I was playing the blues with Augie because he was not a fabulous guitar player. Mm -hmm. And so this added a lot to his music that he was playing rock and roll, and I was sticking the blues in under it. Right. And it kind of elevated it to another different kind of music, another right. mixture. The rock and roll song that we put out on the national scene, not too national, but it went further than just St. Paul and Minneapolis. Hi Ho Silver. Hi Ho Silver. Thank you. You heard about that? Oh, yeah, I've heard it. The first. Right, too. 1955, mm -hmm. year I was born. The first rock and roll song that hit so big in the Twin Cities. Mm -hmm. And it was based on going to Chicago blues. At the end of my song, he says, in three more months, we're going on the road, baby. Where in the world did that come from? My drum printer pray going to Chicago. Right. And it, yeah, don't ask me where, because uh, I don't know, baby. And Mr. Brown, Willie Brown, I had gotten into the band, a saxophone player, come up <laughs> the Lone Ranger thing. The Lone Ranger team and we launched into High Ho Silver. Just kind of on the spot. On the spot. This was all unrehearsed. Wow. No ever knew what was the other person didn't know what the other person was doing. And I took that lesson into my music all the way until today. When I go on the bandstand today I, I don't have a set set list. I have a general idea out of my, I don't know, 100 songs, whatever, mm -hmm. that I'm going to play some of those 100 songs. But I don't know which ones. Right. And I don't know which one they're going to come down. So as we're band is co uh, cooperating and conversating with each other, uh, somebody will say, Man, I, my daughter went to Kansas City. Kansas City, Kansas, boom, right. that's, her, <laughs> that's the next song. Right, sparks the idea. Yeah, yeah, and so the ideas are flowing freely, the music is flowing freely, and each person is in the conversation of the music. Tell me about the gigs when Augie and the band opened up for Elvis Presley in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Well, that's, we were at our highest uh, thing. Peak. And so that's what you were saying earlier, that that's why we probably got the gig to, uh, uh, you know, open for the man. Right. How long was your set opening up for Elvis Presley? Well, it ended up to be a song and a half. Right, so tell the story. <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, the first song was bad enough, but when Augie started dancing around in the Bermuda shorts, and uh, that was because of the High Ho Silver song. And, uh, you know... Six more months, we're going on the road, baby. And the audience just burst into cheers. Right. 
See, I didn't get to play my blues song before it or anything. And then Mr. Man came out, you know, like... Colonel Tom Parker. Yeah, and he says, wait a minute, you guys. Hey, you're upstaging my guy here. Right. And I, we didn't bring you on to upstage. We brought you in to warm up for him. Right. Which is what you were just, that's what you were trying to do. Yeah, we, we warmed it up too hot, though. <laughs> you know I mean, we're, we're going to end up scolding the guy <laughs> instead of making it a welcome thing. Wow. So anyway, that happened twice, and so I don't know. It went down in history. And Do you remember Elvis's performance? No, we, we, we had to get out of there. Well, you didn't even get to see Elvis. We didn't get to see him. Hmm. But I had seen him often enough on the TV was coming in pretty strong. Right. And how they had cut his thing from the waist down because he was so busy swinging them hips around, mm -hmm. you know. So that was very indecent at the time. But now it, it, there's no show that you can turn on that there's some music going that they, people ain't swinging their hips. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think I like music better than anything. Ice cream, don't match. Cornbread, I like cornbread. But the cornbread I like is me. Cornbread in the morning. I am James Samuel Cornbread Harris Sr. Cornbread every night. I have been making music for 65 years, and I'm still going. Uh, something I don't think a lot of people know is that you are the father of the great Twin Cities producer, Jimmy Jam, of Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. Oh, yes. Okay. Now, you, you obviously had an influence on a young Jimmy growing up. Influence? I played a few notes. I showed him how to play the scale. And uh, I uh, kind of let him in on how my music lesson and how to play the song. Long, long, da 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 You know. And then uh, I had played with him. He was playing drums at the time a little bit. Uh, and these drummers come up without lessons or anything. Mm -hmm. They didn't get a, some sticks and start beating on any, any old um, thing. Pots and pans. Pots and pans or whatever. And then they get a set of drums and they beat on them. And then they find out somebody's got a band and they edge their way in there. And then the band plays and they listen a while and then they start pounding on the drums, you know. And then after they do that for a few gigs, then they're drummers. You know, it's amazing. It's a, it's a sort of a talent that uh, you, very few people go to drum school right to be drummers and the ones that do don't seem to get as many gigs as, as the ones we, that don't yes <laughs> yes because the ones that go to school have this superiority complex oh look at what i can do mm -hmm. what was your next move okay uh that, so augie kind of made me a little more popular and famous naturally playing with him uh, I got started with a group, Ice Blues Band. Uh, Ice Blues Band was a cooperative thing with the drummer. <laughs> how, right. did that, how did that get back into the conversation? Right. And he was one of the uneducated type drummers, and he had drummed in church behind the spiritual singers in the chorus and stuff. And so he and I put together this uh, Ice Blues Band. And we got a boy and a girl, and him and I, I think, yeah, I think that was it. Because my left hand was my bass player, mm -hmm. <laughs> and my right hand was the melody maker. And then uh, the guitar guy was pretty good at chording. So that really helps when you have that solid chord background going, you do, man. That helps so much. And then you put that bass line under that solid chord progression. I there mean, you go. I just had that good luck of, of having uh, a, a lady singer came along. Uh, Bourbon Straight Up was one of her songs. 
Cornbread, you are such a part of the fabric of the Twin Cities music scene. And you're still playing regularly. You play every Friday night at the Loring Pasta Bar in Dinky Town. That is correct. It's rising got like Phoenix out of the ashes. Out of the ashes. Six yeah. to nine every Friday. <clears throat> every second Saturday of the month, uh, six to nine at Hell's Kitchen, a great restaurant downtown. Oh, they got it going on. Yeah. I didn't, if I, even if, if I wasn't there, they would be going great guns. In a, one of the largest Bloody Marys in the world. That thing stacks like that. Oh, Have you seen them? Oh, I didn't pay no attention to that. I'm, I drink cornbread specials. Which is what? Cranberry, pineapple, and orange. Ooh, that's healthy. Yes. Haven't we had enough debate? Did I hear someone say, let's wait? Why don't we get together before it's too late to put the world back together? Put the world back together. Put the world back together again. Right in the country, sounds insane. Smell your polluted water. Feel your acid rain. <laughs> Cut down your forest, why don't you? Plant them back again, I said. Put the world back together. Put the world back together. Put the world back together again. Politicians are talking fear and hate. Or someone say, let's have a war. Blow them all away. That's stupid. Can't you hear me when I say, put the world back together put the world back together put the world back together Back together again. Thank you, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, of the viewing, of the listening, of the whoever audience. I enjoyed. You, and I hope you enjoyed me. Amen. Welcome back to Wall of Power TV. I'm your host, Paul Metza. Our guest tonight, Mr. Cornbread Harris. Playing in those nursing homes, you're probably older at nine years old than a lot of the people that are in there. Oh, that's, I might be. 
I might be, you know, 70, 80, 85, 87, whatever. I'm older than they are. How do they respond? They respond really well. And I'm good with Alzheimer's people and a uh, uh, couple of those other uh, supposed to be aged diseases or whatever. Right. And this brings, so I play old songs a lot of times that brings back memories to them. Mm -hmm. And they think I'm the best thing since peanut butter <laughs> and jelly, you know? They think, wow, this guy can really play. And that's another thing about that particular thing. If you understand your audience, because they're who make you, you can play your same songs, whatever you want to play. If they like them, then you're in. Right. And if you play your own songs and they don't like them, then you're not in. So if you can find out somewhere along the line what songs they dig the most and play those, then hey, now you got it. You'll be working. You'll be working. <laughs> and I think I work a day or two a month, I think. So no. And so this is what I want to tell my rest of my uh, musician friends. Play for your audience, not for yourself. But whatever it is that they like, if you can possibly do it at all, try to do it. And, and uh, I, my band is catching on to my little trick that I do. It's not a trick, though. This is seriously how I feel about my audience. You're not anything, and I'm sure that in our interview this has come up already before, you're not anything without that audience. You're not anything. You can play in your living room, dining room, bathroom, whatever. Right. All the same stuff. But when you take that bathroom, living room stuff out and 40,000 people come out to hear you do it, oh, wow, look at this big star. <laughs> Come on. Right? Plus, you can't pay yourself. So yeah. that's the other part of having a good audience, right? Yeah. What would you tell a young musician coming up? Well, I would tell them uh, to be generous, kind, loving, unselfish. I mean, this is the things, the traits that endear you to people. I mean, power over the people does not endear you. Yeah, uh, being subservient to people is what endears you. I, I remember at the uh, awards, Sally Awards, when I stood up there, I think the most uh, remembered sentence of my presentation and thank you was, if you want to be a star, be a giver. And that, that, that changed the whole show at that particular event. If you want to be a star, be a giver. I don't think there's a better way to end this interview than with that pearl of wisdom. Mm -hmm. In Cornbread, uh, you're playing all the time. I'm going to come out and see you soon. I want to thank you so much mm -hmm. for not only taking the time for us tonight on Wall of Power TV, mm -hmm. but for being such a a tried and true Twin Cities legend in providing so much great music for thousands and thousands of people over your 70-year career, I might add. Wow, yeah. And so you bring your acts with you. Oh, I will. And then you sit in for half a song or, 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 or a song. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, you kick me out at any time. <laughs> Wouldn't be the first time. Cornbread Harris, thanks so much. God bless you, my friend. God bless you.